This is Arab Talk on KPOO San Francisco, 89.5 FM. This is Arab Talk with Jess and Jamal. I'm Jess Khanam. And this is Jamal Dejani. Jamal, we have a very great show again today. We want to welcome our listeners to Arab Talk here in San Francisco on KPOO. But what we're going to talk about today among many things, it's just kind of the drumbeats of war that are being ginned up by not only the U.S. media, but the U.S. State Department, including Mike Pompeo, the drumbeat of war against Iran. This week, you know, two tankers around the Gulf of Oman were attacked, and this makes, I think, now the fourth, uh, the four, four tankers now in the Gulf area that have been attacked, and in the absence of any compelling information about who is behind these attacks, what we see, again, is a rush to judgment, and the rush to judgment is to blame the Iranians and the Iranians for attacking these tankers and uh, creating what we like to call here on Arab Talk the drumbeats of war. Mike Pompeo, John Bolton, you know, the diplomatic corps under the direction of Mike Pompeo. But unfortunately, Jamal, it also seems as if the U.S. media is playing along with this, uh, this rush to war with Iran. That's right. Uh, and yes, you know, these are the words that we have been hearing, you know, such as Iran is highly likely to have caused the explosions. I mean, when you hear something like this, high, cl- high Highly likely. likely. I mean, is there a proof? There is no proof. Or there is no proof. But when you start, I mean, this is repeated time and time again. So in the minds of the viewers or the listeners, when they hear that Iran is highly likely to have caused the explosions, which hit two tankers in the Gulf of Oman today. So Washington has been saying this. The media has been saying this amid fears that repeated attacks on ships could put the West's oil supply under threat. So you're talking about this is how you create this whole perception that Iran now is going to affect the entire oil industry right. and its delivery to the West and the rest of the war, the world. So, so you know, we know today a fireball erupted on the empty front altar after a suspected torpedo torpedo attack, and I'll come back when we when we talk about the suspected torpedo attack, caused three explosions, forcing the crew to abandon ship. Sailors on the Kuka Courageous also had to flee after a pair of blasts today, which have left uh, basically the entire world, not just the Middle East, on high alert. So, so we have this created emergency, right? And, 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 and here, is the, here is the kind of the funny thing. These attacks, you know, targeting, for example, the, both, the, both, by the way, the Altair uh, and the Japanese-owned uh, Kokuka Courageous, uh, which were evacuated, you know, they were flying, uh, I mean, these are, um, you know, Japanese ships, right? And, and this happened on the same day that the Japanese prime minister was visiting Iran and in fact was re- meeting with the leader. That's right. Uh, so, so this is, you know, on the same day that the Japanese leader Shinzo Abe was there. So why would Iran attack two Japanese boats or right. when the, the prime minister was there? I think he, I, I don't think a Japanese prime minister has ha, had been in Iran for the past 30 years or so. Well, yeah. And, you know, Jamal, what, what, what's interesting to me about all of this is in the midst of this heightened attack uh, on, you know, alleging that Iran is involved in these attacks on these oil tankers, don't you find it kind of interesting that the price of oil has gone down significantly at this time? Something is go- it doesn't make sense. Something else is going on here. Number one, the reports from the region itself, if we look at the region itself, from the news reporting in the region itself, from Oman, from actually what is left of the media in Yemen, from Qatar, from generally the region over there, there is no evidence to support the fact 
that the Iranians were behind this, responsible for it, either directly or indirectly. Secondly, as I said, the price of oil, can, the barrel price is going down. Typically, in, in a situation like this, when you have a crisis, you know, a crisis that's being manufactured by Pompeo and by the Israelis and by MBS and the Saudis, you would expect the price of oil to go up. But isn't it interesting? It's going down. So my question to you, Jamal, is the same question that we always have on Arab Talk, which is, to whose benefit is it to create this crisis in the Gulf of Oman right now? Who benefits from this the most? Well, I mean, I know the answer. We both know the answer. But many will benefit. But I want to take us a little bit back because this did not happen in, you know, in vacuum. Right. The, the United States, who is the national security advisor? John Bolton. John Bolton has been talking about the threat of Iran for the past several months, ever since his appointment, really. His basically raison d'etre has been the destabilization of Iran and Venezuela, among, right. among maybe other countries. But those are the two prime countries that he has been focusing on. One of them is Venezuela, and we know what's going on in Venezuela. Yes. And then it's Iran. And by the way, this is the same, the same person who basically said that Iraq had weapons of mass destruction. Exactly. And so we went through that whole scenario. You know, he's assuming that Americans and the rest of the world have short memory. So we don't remember that they created this whole lie and this whole pretext to invade Iraq looking for weapons of mass de destruction. Which never existed. Which never existed. And we know the end result to that adventure that not only Iraqis have paid with their dear lives uh, for this so-called lie or mistake, as they say, but also Americans have died because of well, this. Well, and, and uh, we should point and, out that can, they continue to die. And so now, so now they have to come, and, 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 and he has been talking about Iran for years. It's not a coincidence. So now they have to come up with something new. And that something new, Jess, is basically to say, well, Iran. Iran. And they've been talking about Iran. So we've heard about Iran being a threat to Saudi Arabia. And there was an incident also just a week ago targeting Saudi Arabia, right? So right. You, had, you had this. And again, the quick answer was, who were the perpetrators? They didn't say Iran. They said the Houthis who were supported by Iran. So again, they they point the fingers towards Iran. The Houthis targeted Saudi Arabia, which yeah, but Saudi, Jamal, Ar why, why? Saudi Arabia has been bombing the hell right. out of, uh, so out of why, Yemen. Why would the Houthis want to target but, Saudi but Arabia? Then, but then they didn't, they didn't stop there. They went and shifted uh, the conversation and said Iran was responsible. So now we have, we have the leader of Japan. We have Shinzo Abe, who basically was meeting with the supreme leader, with Iran's supreme leader. And then there was an attack on the two tankers that had been carrying so-called Japan-related cargo. Makes no sense. What a coincidence. Yeah. I mean, they've hit the jackpot, uh, Jess. I mean, here we have a meeting or a rapprochement trying to defuse the situation between Japan and Iran, and all of a sudden you have this uh, dual attack uh, using torpedoes. So let me ask the second question. In whose interest is it to disrupt the relationship between Japan and Iran? It's the same answer as in whose interest is it to make sure that Iran is identified as somehow the boogeyman for everything that is going on in the Gulf of Oman. Well, we know... We know the answer to that already. We know who has been beating the drums of war. Absolutely. So the drums of war, basically, uh, which, again, this didn't start today or yesterday or the week before targeting Iran. You have the United States, you have Israel, and you have Saudi Arabia. 
those are the three main players along with supporters like the UAE and so forth. But the main players who have been constantly beating the drums of war against Iran have been the United States, especially under this administration, because we can say that before. The, it's the United States who now has reneged on the agreement, on the uh, agreement that was basically uh, you know, done under the Obama administration. And then, and Saudi Arabia has been a, a major supporter and pointing the fingers towards Iran. And then you have Israel. Now, something kind of caught my attention. What's that? And this, what caught my attention, that the attack, the recent attack that happened was done by a torpedo. Now, I don't know, I'm not a military expert, but tor torpedoes usually are launched from a submarine. We know that one country I mean, has I mean, a submarine. I mean, I mean, you know, yes, they can be launched by, I don't know, boats, but it's I difficult. associate the attack uh, of a torpedo uh, that should would have been done by a submarine. Israel has submarines, not one, not two. But four. But more than three submarines, yeah. and especially highly advanced ones that it has recently acquired from Germany. That's right. In fact, they are nuclear-powered submarines and capable of launching nuclear missiles. So Israel has submarines. The United States has submarines. The Russians have submarines. Uh, who else in, in, in that kind of narrow... There's no evidence that the Iranians have submarines. Well, no they do, but why, why, would they, why would they attack right in their own backyard a country that they have been working on uh, or having a rapprochement with them like Japan. Why would they attack a, a, a two tankers flying a Japanese flags when they're meeting with their prime minister? Does this, make, does this make any sense? Well, I'll tell you the sense that it makes, Jamal. It makes geopolitical sense. It makes geopolitical sense from the point of view that there are three main players who are bent, and I dare say, I think I can say this on the radio, hell-bent, uh, on creating another boogeyman in the region. It's not enough that we have completely undermined and destroyed, for decades to come, Iraq, uh, Afghanistan, that the entire region is destabilized, that the Palestinian question continues to go unresolved, that Syria is torn asunder for generations to come, the Israelis, the Americans, and the Saudis and the Gulf states, minus Qatar, will not rest until Iran suffers from the same fate. And I, I know we're kind of going into a deep dive right now about this whole thing, but the reality is that the, the, when we ask the question, who benefits from this, the Iranians do not benefit from this. The Japanese do not benefit from this. The only people that benefit from this attack on these tankers are the Israelis, the Americans, the Saudis, and the other Gulf states. Nobody else benefits from this. Well, why would Iran basically invite other countries to launch war against it? Exactly. Iran also itself is in the oil business. Why would it want to disrupt the flow of oil? I mean, it doesn't make sense. Now, who has been beating the drums of war? Who has been egging the United States to strike Iran for years, not months. Benjamin Netanyahu. Well, yeah, it's been the Israelis. You, you, recall, you recall the show and tell that Benjamin Netanyahu put at the United Nations exactly. showing his picture of a bomb, a ticking bomb or whatever. That's when he was talking, and this is when he was trying to persuade right. the Obama administration, basically to do his dirty business, to attack uh, Iran to launch a, to launch a war against Iran. Right. Then again, they came up with this uh, uh, this concocted, I would say, story that the Israeli Mossad stole documents about the Iran nuclear program. Like you know, they leave documents around. They went into Tehran and broke into this safe and got these documents, basically spelling the beans that Iran was engaged. And and again, let 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 us uh, remind ourselves. Who, which country is the only country that has nuclear weapons uh, in the Middle East? Let me guess, Jamal. Let me think. Uh, maybe Israel? 
So, so, and Israel, because it was engaged in this covert operation of acquiring nuclear weapons, basically in enriching uranium in the 60s, right. and working with apartheid South Africa and testing their weapons in South Africa, let's, let's just go there, they assume that everyone in the Middle East wants nuclear weapons. So they have been trying to undermine Iran forever ever since the revolution happened and ever since the Shah was left the country because Israel had a great relationship with the Shah of Iran. And the United States, by the way, was the country to, to supply the reactors under the Shah for, uh, you know, for energy or That's what right. have you. So now uh, Benjamin Netanyahu uh, has been through all kinds of uh, circuses, I would say. He went to the United Nations. He put also another uh, with his show and tell. He went on national TV also talking about how the Mossad stole uh, these evidence documents uh, showing that Iran is working on its nuclear weapons. This did not work. So we're done with that. The people or the international community is not buying the, the story that Iran is hell-bent on acquiring nuclear weapons. No one buys it. No, no one is buying it, and, 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 and uh, so they have to invent something new. What's the new thing? The, uh, Iran has never invaded a neighboring country. No. Never. Well, it's actually Saddam Hussein who invaded Iran. Right. And we supported Saddam Hussein over this crazy 10-year war that killed millions of people. So Iran hasn't uh, threatened the United States. You don't see Iranian uh, submarines uh, off the coast of Florida right no. here. And so the only thing left is to create the story that they are targeting the global supply of oil. Well, Jamal, there's another parsimonious explanation for this. And we like to use the concept of Occam's razor, which is we prefer elegant, relatively straightforward, non-complicated analyses to conspiracy theories. The conspiracy theory is trying to paint Iran as working against their best interests, working against their own national interests, and, and, and somehow targeting these tankers both in the Persian Gulf and in the Omani Gulf. The reality is, is that it is not in the Iranian interest to do any of that. And full stop, and in the absence of any other information, and based on the information from the region itself, it appears that there's only two or three possibilities. It's the Israelis, it's the Saudis with the help of the other Gulf countries, minus Qatar, or some combination of the two, with the United States intelligence. That's the only reasonable possibility. Now, let's say by magic, the Houthis obtained nuclear submarines with... Uh, which is magic, <laughs> which is impossible. Magic. The Houthis somehow were able to obtain nuclear subs and fired their torpedo against these tankers. Even if you came up with such a crazy idea, the Houthis, their major target you know, is they're angry at the Saudis and the... Not the Japanese. Not the Japanese and not the Iran. And, you know, they're, they're not angry at anybody except the Saudis and the, and the UAE for destroying Yemen and for killing Yemeni civilians. And children. And children, creating one of the largest health crises in the, you know, in the modern era. That's who the Houthis are targeting. So even if the Houthis are behind this in some way, which is unlikely, given the nature of the attack. So, so, so listen to this. I mean, the, the kind of confusing thing, because, you know, we're talking about targeting the Japanese ships and whatever. It's even more complex than this and, and, and something that we need to explain. What does it mean for a ship to sail under a country's flag? So just to tell you, like these countries that are listed on the ship have nothing to do with the conflict. They are not, you know, related to the United States, Israel, even Saudi Arabia. You know, just these last two ships, uh, just that were hit by uh, the torpedoes. Yeah. Who? What are? What flags? They are, they are owned 
by Norwegian and Japanese firms. They are registered in the Marshall Islands and Panama. Right. Okay. Those, those two nations have more ships registered to them than any other country. I don't know the reason why many uh, uh, shipping count companies like to register their ships in ta Panama ta and, tax and Marshall Islands. It could be that. But, but basically, if a ship is registered in a country or otherwise known as sailing under the country's flag, because I was talking about the country, it is covered by the maritime laws of that nation. Okay. So, in other words, a ship can fly one flag at a time, but its owners are free to change its registration. It's a very complex thing. But what I'm saying is, and you're right, foreign ship owners pay no income taxes in Panama and have access to cheap labor. So there is a whole complex thing. And Panama has been advertising and boasting to the, basically, to the whole uh, shipping industry that uh, there is no requirement for uh, for an owner to be Panam Panamanian. Yeah, and, uh, there's similarly, lots of advantages. Offshore firms pay no tax in the Marshall Islands. Uh, and other countries kind of like play a whole thing, you know, Liberia, Hong Kong, Singapore, Malta, the Bahamas, because I've been doing some research on the darn thing to see who owns these ships. They have nothing to do with the United States. They have nothing to do with Israel. They have nothing to do with Saudi Arabia. They have nothing to do with any so-called enemies or rivals to Iran. So why would Iran attack these ships? Iran did not attack these ships, Jamal. There's no... Um, analysis that you could come up with. And people should not trust uh, John Bolton. People should not trust Mike Pompeo. Which he said again today he was right. like more right. assertive in right. his accusation. Sure. Uh, it, suffice it to say that to trust Mike Pompeo and John Bolton on this issue is um, not going to serve you well. You're just going to come up with uh, a bunch of crazy conspiracy theories about what's going on. Always ask your question and whose interest it is. Based on all of the analyses, and we've come up with a bunch today, it does not make sense whatsoever that either Iran or Japan, for obviously, to be involved in this. I think, Jamal, I mean, let's call it what it is, right? If we call it what it is, what we're saying to our listeners, and let me, let me kind of spell it out. Donald Trump knows that he's in a heap of trouble for his reelection. Donald Trump knows that the best way for him to get reelected is to create yet another crisis, crisis slash war. Right. And his idea, I believe, being spurred by Bolton and Pompeo, let's beat the drums of war against Iran now, starting in 2019. So by the time we get to 2020 and the next election cycle, we can be fully involved in another catastrophic uh, crisis and destabilized country in the Middle East, which will guarantee Trump's reelection. That's my theory, Jamal. You're missing one. Well, one. Well, I, of course. Donald Trump yeah. listens to Benjamin Netanyahu. Well, I was going to come to that. The okay. second, the second is that Benjamin Netanyahu is up for re-election too. And what's the best way for Benjamin Netanyahu to get elected again? War with Iran or some big conflict or with Iran. Or mobilizing the United States or to mobilize do So I think, Jamal, when we, at, when we scratch the surface even more about in whose interest this is, it's really coming from the Israelis and the Americans' election Crisis. It's, it's a setup, and I'll go through the timeline quickly. Okay, let's do that. So May 5th, this is, you know, and, and it goes before that. The U.S. says it's sending the USS Abraham Lincoln carrier group and a bomber task force to the Middle East because of a credible, and I'm taking the word, this is from the Department of Defense, credible threat from Iran. Since then, Washington has announced a dispatch to the region of an amphibious assault ship a Patriot missile battery, and 1,500 uh, soldiers. You basically. forgot the B-52s. No, no. This is May 5th. Oh, I'm May giving 5th. you this okay. is a timeline. Okay. May 8th, you know, Iran vows to enrich its uranium stockpile because the, the threats, they, they, they said, listen, you guys don't want to adhere to the agreement, then we can go back to right. doing what we were doing before because you're not respecting the agreement that you signed. Right. 
And and so the U.S. response by imposing fresh san- sanctions on Iran, uh, steel and mining sectors. May 12th, two Saudi oil tankers and two other ships are damaged in a mysterious, again, other sabotage attacks. We have no proof, nothing. All of a sudden, mysteriously, these ships get sabotaged off the coast of uh, uh, Fujairah, part of the UAE, where, again, we don't have proof, we don't have evidence, we don't have pictures, all what we know, there was a sabotage attack. May 14th, the, uh, the Houthis carry out a drone attack near Riyadh, shutting down a key Saudi oil pipeline. And the next day, the United States says, Iran is responsible. Yeah, it makes a lot of so, sense, so right? So the Houthis attack, and then we say, again, uh, Iran, we gotta, we got to watch out. They're, 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 they're seeking those Su- uh, Houthis against Saudi Arabia and the oil interest. May 19th, Trump wars the Iranians and saying that if they keep doing this, this will be, and this is, these are his words, that will be the official end of Iran. I mean, he, I mean, the president of the United States, has basically said that Iran faces complete annihilation. That's how I inter- interpret it. Well, official that's how everybody end, interpreted it. Yeah. And the Iranian uh, foreign minister, Javad Zarif, says that uh, genocidal taunts of uh, U.S. Trump will not end Iran. So now we're getting, again, this is all heating up. June 6, UAE says a multinational investigation to sabotage attacks. Point to the likelihood a state was behind them without incriminating Iran. June 12, what day is it today? Today is the 13th. Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe arrives in Tehran in a bit to mediate between Washington and Tehran. The guy is coming and say, let me be the peacemaker. He goes there. And then his ship, the, the ships that basically have Japanese products and get, flying, get you know, they get attacked. You know, they get attacked. Also, um, there's an attack, a Yemeni rebel missile attacked on the airport of Abha in southwestern Saudi Arabia, which wounds 26 civilians. The United States and Saudi Arabia accuse Iran behind it. They say they, that this is, this is the work of Iran. So it's a setup, step by step, going back early in May. There is like these skirmishes. Let's see what sticks. But we will know, attack this already ship here, this, that, and we keep saying it's right. Iran, 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 and eventually. It's going to be Iran. It, it's going to be Iran, which is going to get attacked. And this is how they're selling this story to the first to the American public and then the international community to justify a war against Iran. And that's why when we say the beats of drums are getting louder, they're getting louder by the minutes. And if people and the international community is uh, are going to basically drink the cool aid. Uh, they are not, Jamal. I- I'm going to be like really shocked after no. what they have seen. No, no, but listen. Just what happened to Iraq, it's the same scenario. Right. It's just with different, it's the same actors. Right. But here's the difference. The international community is not, is not buying it. There is no grand international coalition at this point that, is, that was mobilized with the invasion of uh, Iraq. If you remember, when, when Iraq was invaded, there was the coalition, as George Bush put it, of the, the willing. willing. It was not just the EU, but it was uh, West Asian, it was East Asian countries. It involved Australia, New Zealand, Canada. I mean, it was really a global effort. There is nothing like that now, Jamal. The EU has come out critical, either two things. They've either been silent or they've been critical of this analysis. You have nobody right now except Israel, UAE, Saudi Arabia, and the United States that are beating this drum right now. They're the only ones that are beating this drum. No one else is going to go along with this. And But the I, question is, do you think that Donald Trump will do it? No, I don't about think about whether he gets no. international support or No, not. I don't I don't think he cares, but having So that that's kind of the danger. Basically, I think what he's doing is setting it to 
mostly the Republicans. No, and mostly to, his, to the Israelis. And to his base. And Benjamin Netanyahu yeah, is selling Israelis. it to the Israelis. Right. And they don't care about the rest of the world. They don't. Now, to be extremely cynical about it, I think that actually Donald Trump understands in his limited capacity that an attack on Iran right now would be devastating. He actually ran, if you remember, Jamal, he actually ran against all the stupid wars that the United States had, had, uh, had engaged in, was critical of George Bush, was critical of the war in Iraq, was critical of the war in Afghanistan, said that they were a waste. I think what they're going to try to do is, uh, is to have their cake and to eat it too. I think they're going to beat the drum against Iran and to a feverish pitch with the idea that this will help the election in the United States for Donald Trump and Benjamin Netanyahu. Well, you think that, yeah, well Benjamin Netanyahu doesn't have the time because Benjamin Netanyahu's re-election or for the second time. Second real. The second try is in September. Uh, September, October. Yeah, yeah it's around way. the corner. Yeah. Donald Trump has two years. Well, about a ye year and a half. Yeah. yeah. Not that much time. So, so with this, the pace, I'm, I'm just, when I talked about the timeline, that the pace that they have been going through is very fast. That it the is. next attack or the... Or, or another crazy thing that should happen is going, going to prompt a reaction. What if there is a confrontation between Iranian ships in the, in the, in the Persian Gulf and American ships, which we've seen it coming well, it, very close. Very, and, very and, close. And, and, and someone gets hurt. Or the U.S. You know, attacks an Iranian boat or vice yeah. versa because of the proximity. Then we're going to have... Well, here's the good a major crisis. But here's the good hands. news, Jamal. I have good news for you. The Iranians are actually very smart. <laughs> They're very sophisticated. Their political and military analysis is very sophisticated and very smart. They actually know that they are being baited by the United States and by the Israelis and by the Saudis right now. They understand that this is a... Uh, this is they're being baited and they are being invited to bite the bait. The Iranians won't do that. But what they will do, they, they have a very sophisticated cyber section within their country. And they very well could do things to undermine at a cyber level and using cyber attacks could undermine and fight back to send a little message back to Benjamin Netanyahu, to Donald Trump and to the Saudis back off. And I think to... To some extent, maybe minus Donald Trump, everybody else gets that, that the Iranians are actually extremely sophisticated when it comes to these types of analyses. So well, I'm a little bit more optimistic that there won't be full-out war, but what I do think is that there's going to be a lot more tension. Well, I think we're getting very close, and uh, uh, before we continue, just want to remind our listeners, this is Arab Talk on KPOO San Francisco, Absolutely. 89.5 FM, and, and thanks to all those people who have been watching us on uh, Facebook Live. Uh, I so, want to yeah. I I leave it here because I want to also talk a little bit about Sudan. Yeah, we should talk about Sudan, Jamal. And because that's another crisis. Uh, we will be monitoring the situation very closely. Right. And we will be talking about it probably next week. But I am not as optimistic as you are, Jess. I'm a little bit more this, optimistic, yeah. On this, I'm very nervous. Nervous? Because this is, it, this will make the invasion of Iraq, and, and this is very hard for me to say, this will make it look like a picnic. No, I agree with An you. An attack on Iran will be devastating. No, I agree with that. And uh, let me and on I, all fronts for the entire region and on a global level. But Jamal, you know, because because you said something very important, which is the Iranians are are far more intelligent, I think, like their leadership than Saddam Hussein at the time. Absolutely, uh, but but they're so, also so it's going to be very devastating, and it's but, against our interest right here in this country and hopefully the sane minds in this country will think about this hard that we don't have to fight Israel's war for them again for them again. In, in the region again. or protect Saudi interests a country that violates human rights on a daily basis a country that slaughters children in 
Yemen, and an apartheid regime, right. which is Israel, that has been engaged in starving Palestinians in Gaza. It's kind of crazy that we but, put these resources and risk American lives. This is not what we should be focusing on. Jamal, let me just say one thing. Um, I am even surprised that I'm going to say it, but I'm going to say it anyways. The Israeli military also understands they are, despite being, uh, you know, involved in the most grotesque human rights violations, and the Israeli military have been involved in killing men, women, and children on a regular basis in Gaza and the West Bank and in other parts of the world, including in Syria, as we know. But they're not stupid from this point of view. Well, they, they know they're going to sustain heavy losses. Oh, are you kidding? If they, if they think that engaging Iran is going to come at no cost Big to cost. Israel, they are delusional. And they're not delusional. So I, I share your concern. Well, that's why they want the United States. They feel they no, cannot but they do will it pay, alone. They will pay the price if, if you, they know that, well, maybe the United States will just like. No. Like, if, you the know, United you States, have Donald Trump saying that Iran right. will be no longer. In other words, Iran won't exist. This is right. what he has been threatening, total annihilation. Right. I take that very seriously. As, as we should. But what I'm saying is that even if the United States is the one that carries the water on the invasion or some sort of military engagement with Iran, the Isra Israel is not going to be let off the hook. Trust me on this one. No, no, it won't be. They, they, they will. It, it, ironically, it might be the Israelis, despite their wish to have Iran destabilized. It might be the Israeli military that says, hey, whoa, hold on, hold your horses here, because the cost to the Israelis would be devastating in a huge way. Well, we're going to leave it uh, at this. We'll continue. We'll pick up the conversation next, next week. Next week, of course. We have to talk about Sudan. Sudan, Jamal, we is a disaster. We have been trying actually to get a guest here who was supposed to be here on this show two weeks ago. Tried again. We tried again to have him here. He's from Sudan, but I guess probably he's, busy. he's very busy and also... There are concerns from for people safety, from Sudan for not to appear in front of the public or, you know, because of the issues. So the situation has been deteriorating. The, the information that we get about Sudan, it's really through mostly social media. You know, the, uh, there's major crackdown on the demonstrators, the pictures that we've been receiving from the streets, more than 100 people just died in the past two days. Yeah, it's devastating. It's really coming from reports here and there through, you know, uh, activists. The, 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 um, the, I would say now the junta, which is really running the country, has been doing all kinds of things to prevent the flow of information that they actually had a nationwide internet blackout the other day. And the internet blackout came after a violent police dispersal of protesters in the nation's capital of Khartoum. So since then, uh, access to mobile internet has been entirely shut down, um, leaving many people uh, cut off. Uh, again, we're getting bits and pieces, but we know that there is a major, basically, clampdown on the protesters, including right. the killing of more than a hundred of them. Right, and here's here's what I think, uh, Jamal. Unfortunately, the Sudanese ter caretaker government right now, which is supposed to be a transitional junta, a transitional body to help them go from the brutal dictatorship of President Bashir to a more democratically mm -hmm. elected uh, a representative de democratically elected uh, uh, process for the Sudanese, which is what they've been fighting for for the last couple of decades. My reading of the situation and what we're getting from some of the context that I have in the, Sud in the Sudan is that the junta, the caretaker government, despite talking a good game of reform, has still been getting, as we say, whisperings in the ear from President Bashir. Nobody knows where the former president of the Sudan is. People are saying that he's still running the show. Some people are saying that he's still whispering in the ear of the transitional government to help Sudan get from point A to point B. And 
because talk is cheap, as we know, especially in this situation uh, in the Sudan. Some people are saying that Sudan is more likely now, unless things turn around more quickly, that they're going to go back to the repressive nature of their rule that they've had for decades and decades and decades. This is really a critical time period for the Sudanese, Jamal, because there was a stand down. I think you were going to report mm -hmm. on that. But the protesters decided to take a break for the next two days. And they've been all, I have to say, the protesters have been amazing, amazing, amazing. Their leadership ha um, has been calling for peaceful protests. Exactly. Not to confront right. uh, the armed police. But this is what we know, Just This is coming again from uh, the activists. Just in three days, 113 people were killed. Right. 723 injured as reported by hospitals. How many arrested? 650 people have been arrested. Right. Rapes. 48 women have reported that they've been, they've been raped. Families have been reporting missing members. A thousand. This is just a rough figure, but a thousand missing individuals. So the situation there, and these are getting from from different, basically, sources, not governmental sources, right. not media outlets, because most media, uh, j most journalists have been kicked out. So we have to rely on reports coming from activists right. and some, you know. But what I'm concerned about, Jamal, frankly, I'm, I'm concerned about the same thing, which is that this is really, uh, unfortunately, if, uh, uh, an attempt to misrepresent to the people of Sudan uh, what is really going on and that my biggest worry is that there is no interest in the power elite, the military power elite in Sudan because that's really who's been running this country for the last 30 years is the military power elite. They may have superficially gotten rid of uh, President Bashir and uh, some of the other uh, intelligence uh, you know, leaders. But the reality is, it's the same group of military elite that are part of this junta right now, this right. transitional government. And I worry that they're playing a very dirty game with the people of Sudan who have literally, literally put their life on the line to bring democracy to the Sudan. I would like to be more optimistic. I'm afraid that it's going to go in a bad direction still. You know, the week before we reported on the 100 uh, Sudanese who were mysteriously found in the Nile, you know, who were killed and then thrown into the Nile River, was devastating. But thankfully, I mean, the real story here, Jamal, that we haven't heard anywhere on the mainstream media is the perseverance, the will, and the integrity of the protesters in Sudan. These are ama the Sudanese in the streets have been amazing. They have been fighting for their rights, for their independence for decades now. And as you said, they have, you know, toned it down a little bit because they see that, you know, the tension right now. I hope that the whoever's, you know, whatever power dynamics are going on right now, that it goes on the side of the people of Sudan. Frankly, I'm not optimistic, Jamal. But time will tell, right? Tomorrow's tomorrow's Friday. Right. Tomorrow's a big day, you know, in terms of uh, the Sudanese going to to Friday prayer and whatever the khutbah will will be, you know, coming from the you know the uh, you know the minarets throughout uh, Khartoum and and the Sudan. We'll see what happens, but. You know, my fingers are crossed, but I, frankly, I'm not. Uh, I'm not optimistic. No, and especially with what's ha happening now. Well, for one thing, the media has not been focusing on nothing. This. So again, we talk about the media and the, its role with the drums of uh, war on Iran, which basically it has been uh, adding more fuel to the fire. Exactly. When it comes to Sudan, you, you're just having spotty reporting, and I, I, I'm afraid that uh, the people will get crushed and silence because they're not going to be receiving any international aid or help or listening to voices at the United Nations trying to advocate on, on their behalf. So we have a few minutes because we have to also, uh, we've been talking a lot about the 
so-called uh, Kushner peace plan. Jamal, what's and, is, don't and, you have breaking updating don't, our listeners don't every you ha- week about what's going don't on? Don't you have breaking news and, about the and, Kushner well, peace plan? Uh, no, every week we have an update, and what, we know where where is this heading to. What, what is the update and for this week? Our discussion. Well, since uh, since we've updated uh, last week about the conference, because. This now has been reduced to a conference in, or economical conference in Bahrain. Uh, so uh, Jordan, Egypt, and Morocco uh, will attend they will. the U.S.-sponsored conference on investment in Palestinian areas in Bahrain in late June, according to the White House. Wow. So, so, so this is... The, this is the this is the newest report. I'm really shocked and about this. I'll report. This. Yeah, I'll, I'll I'll repeat that. Jordan, Egypt, and Morocco will attend the U.S. sponsored conference on investment. This is how they describe it in Palestinian areas. They don't even talk about Palestine. They don't even talk about the West Bank. They don't even talk about Palestinian Authority. They don't talk even about Palestinian territories, Palestinian areas. What's a Palestinian area, Jamal? I guess. It's kind of like the slums where Palestinians live. It's talking about tenements. No, literally, Bantu stands. That's Palestinian What's a area. Palestinian area? I don't understand. Meaning like you have a high population of Palestinians okay. living in these. Uh, so they said that they will attend. Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, and the regional rival Qatar have already told the Trump administration that they will attend. And the conference is supposed to now happen on June 25th. And 26. Jamal, are you? And, and now, wait, wait. Are you a betting man? And it's been do, is now. Are you a betting man? Now it's no longer a conference. By the way, we hear about a workshop. A workshop. Yeah. So it's kind of so been what, downgraded. Can, can from we a just conference. talk about this for a minute? First of all, it was the Grand Peace Plan, which was supposed to come out June 5th. And by the way, this is June 13th. Now there was a, a peace conference or a peace. Convention in Bahrain. It's been downgraded to a working group. It's a workshop. A workshop. Talking about investment. Used to in be the a working group in the Palestinian area. And, and rather than peace in Palestine, it's now economic investment in Palestinian areas. So, what is more? What's beyond a complete joke? Is there anything that is more well, that we can elevate no, in but, terms of but it, what is it, this? Initially, by the way, initially Jordan said that it will not attend. Right. So why did about. why did King Abdullah well, change his mind? When I looked at this and I said, "Hey, it makes sense." What can I tell you? Jordan is dependent on U.S. financial aid. A billion Morocco, dollars. Morocco is dependent on U.S. financial aid. Hundreds of millions of dollars. And Egypt is dependent on U.S. financial aid. Two billion dollars. I mean, at the dollars. end of the day, there was that threat of losing the financial aid. And even Egypt, of course, Egypt's attending, they said they have accepted the invitation. These are the words from the Egyptian media to attend the conference in Bahrain. But that does not mean it will accept the peace plan. It's a joke. They all, they're all going to talk about Palestinians and Palestine without the presence of Palestinians. And it's the same old story determining the future of Palestinians. Wait a minute. Is Jared Kushner going to be there? Of course. He's the host. So, okay, of course, good. So, good. so earlier on Tuesday, uh, Jordan's King Abdullah told Jordanian media that his country should take part in the international conference uh, so that Amman wouldn't be left out of the room. What that? What's that supposed to mean? It means absolutely nothing. Like, we don't want to get left out. But the Palestinians are left out of the room. That's except make, for that stooge, the Jabari stooge that they're bringing from Hebron. I don't even think he'll make it. But I'm just saying, so he said, but we will not abandon, you know, of course, the rhetoric. We will not abandon Jerusalem. They already blah, blah, have. Blah, 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 blah. I have breaking news. They and already abandoned so Jerusalem. At the end of the day, there'll be that full conference put together by U.S. aid recipient countries by Saudi Arabia, of course, Israel is part of the the whole equation, and they will all come up with a so-called plan. Well, that plan is a plan for slavery and apartheid. You know, to help Palestinians financially. So we're not talking about a Palestinian state. We're not talking about Palestinian territory. We're not talking about anything. We're not even talking about autonomy, by the way. It's just like saying, you know what, 
Palestinians don't want to run their own business. They don't want to. They run just want their own money. Country. They just want to. Like this is what Jared Kushner be able to pay their mortgage as if there are mortgages, mortgages and banks and they are like building like crazy. Hey, Jared in Kushner. Area C. Breaking area news. Area C. They cannot even get an Israeli permit. There's no. To, very to build few people have. When uh, illegal colonial settlers are building mortgages. left and right. Uh, he just want to give us uh, some mortgages, maybe maybe one of his uh, banks scams or, or schemes. Oh, I got it. Deutsche Bank. And Deutsche Bank will give Palestinians some mortgages. And, and maybe the, the Kushner group will build apartments in the West Bank. Well, on that breaking news, we want to thank our listeners for joining us again today on Arab Talk. You can listen to us by going to our website, ArabTalkRadio.com. Our podcast can be found there. You can check us out live on Facebook Live at Jamal Dejani 2. We'll see you next week. See you next week.